welcome everyone. I have to say it is it is a uh, it is pleasure to see all the progress happening. You know, it's uh, in a building project. There's there's stages you go through, and you know the, the the first stage of them just moving dirt and putting things out. That's always uh, it's exciting because you see something happening. Uh, so very very excited for that, and, uh, and and just excited for everything happening. Palm Sunday next week and Easter coming up. And my son Pierce is going to be baptized on the 16th, so I think that's going to be awesome. So my dad's going to going to baptize him, and it's going to be wonderful. Well, I've got this uh, a message here today. We are wrapping up our series on uh, reconciled, <clears throat> talking about reconciliation. We've talked about it from multiple aspects uh, between family reconciliation, friends, enemies. Uh, social structures reconciling, and really, uh, you know, we, this is something that we really is 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 the message uh, of of what it means, the message of the cross. You know, that is our message. That's what the Bible says is that we have been given this message of reconciliation, and I think that a lot of it goes back, as we've talked about throughout this whole series, about what it means to be an imager of God. Uh, that that is our purpose is to be reconcilers, to be people that are our peace builders. That that's our our role. That's what God is is actually initially intended for us uh, in the beginning was us us to to go and and create flourishing in our world. And because of the fall, we have broken relationships. Our relationship with God was broken, and He reconciled Himself to us through Jesus on the cross with his death, burial, and resurrection. And then we are been given back our purpose to reconcile our, the world together. And so that is a, it's a concept that, that the thread goes throughout the whole Bible and really, really and truly is what our purpose is as Christians. Uh, there's a, a, a verse in a chapter of the Psalm, Psalm 85. I'm not going to read the whole passage because uh, we don't have time this morning. Um, we might at the end, I might come back to this, but uh, this is a, a psalm, you know, the, the Psalms, the book of Psalms is, a, is literally a book of songs or a book of poetry. And this is an actual song. You know, there's, there's even a, a part in here where the, the word Selah is used. There's like, it literally means like uh, refrain. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> in in this, this song tells the story of, of Israel being in right standing with God, God choosing them, and then them walking away from God and rebelling, and then a future hope of him reconciling again with Israel, which is a future hope for Israel when it was written, but it's a, a, a current realization that we have now that God has reconciled himself to us. But there's this, this verse Psalm 85, verse 10, where there are four voices, or four characters that come out that are personified, that, that, that come together, and that it paints this picture of, of these four voices coming together. They're, they're parts of God's character. They're parts of who he is. And in that place is the place of reconciliation. And he says this, the mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Another translation says justice and peace have kissed. And it's interesting because these, these four voices, these four uh, personas, as they, they come together, they, they in, on the surface level, can almost seem in conflict with each other. That, that mercy and truth... Would, would come together, they would meet, so they become like interwoven with each other, and that justice and peace, you know, sometimes we, we, uh, we, can, we can look at them as opposites, but they're not opposites, and, and so this verse is a very interesting idea and concept, and actually, throughout all of Scripture, we see these coming into reality, coming into what it means to be reconciled. And I think that this, as this is painting the picture of God reconciling himself to us as these four come in together in this place of reconciliation, I think it's also a model for us as we attempt to reconcile in our world. 
Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is the truth. And it's interesting that <clears throat> he says this, this too. This is uh, from the Sermon on the Mount. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called children of God, imagers of God, his offspring, his representation. In a moment, we're gonna, I'm going to invite some people up, and we're going to read a script <clears throat> that brings to life these four voices and how they work together in this place of reconciliation. But before we do that, I wanted to, to dive in and see uh, what the, the biblical definition of these words are. are. And I'm the, the type of person that, that you know, sometimes uh, preachers will, will, you know, use one verse and then kind of preach a whole sermon on it. Uh, I'm not really, that's not my style, because I really like to dive in to see what the Bible has to say about something. And this is, in, in this format of looking at, at four concepts or four uh, four voices in this place of reconciliation, we can see the threads of it all throughout Scripture. So let's just look at these, each of these one by one. Uh, truth. Uh, Jesus is the truth. You know, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the truth. But what does that, that mean? You know, if you're in a, in a test, in school, it's a true or false test, and, you know, if you just wrote Jesus is the answer for all of them, like, you're going to fail that test. You know, it's hard to say, like, well, how do we apply that? What, is it, what does truth mean? And I think the, the first, first dynamic of that, the first uh, uh, is that, that God is truth. He is true. He is 100% pure, 100% integrity. There's uh, strength and no weakness in that truth. And that's what Jesus is. But then there's another aspect of truth that is, it's almost like saying the opposite of a lie. And in the context of reconciliation, I think that this is more of what we're looking at. It's being, it's judging things correctly, seeing things rightly. Uh, truth is the absence of lies. Truth is the, the whole story. Zechariah 8, 16, and 17 says, tell the truth to each other. Render verdicts in your courts that are just and lead to peace. We even see these, these ideas of justice and peace interwoven in this. Don't scheme against each other. Stop your loving of telling lies that you swear are the truth. I hate all these things, says the Lord. <clears throat> truth is not just knowing the right answers. Truth is seeing all of the perspective. Truth is knowing the, the whole picture, seeing the whole picture, knowing the whole story. You know, if you've ever, uh, you know, I remember when I, when I was a kid, you know, I, I was, uh, for, for whatever reason, I guess it's a good thing, but it was, it was difficult for me to say a lie. Like, it was hard for me to, to lie. And so, uh, when I didn't want to tell the truth, you can you know, you can selectively omit things in order to tell a story where, you know, perhaps you're looking like the good one or it's not as bad as it was because you didn't give all the details. That's not truth because we're hiding part of the story. We're, 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 we're omitting part of it. But that's not the truth that we're talking about here. Ephesians 4.25 says, Stop telling lies. Let your neighbor, let, let us tell our neighbors the truth for we are all part of the same body. And the truth is something that we understand fully, that we know, that we see, that we speak. It doesn't have anything hidden. It's not edited. There's no spin put on it. The truth is. The truth is the reality. Like, like God, when, uh, when Moses said, well, tell me your name, and he said, my name is I am. That's how truth is. Truth is. It is the reality. The second voice that we see is mercy. Jesus said, God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. The most real expression of mercy is 
Jesus dying on the cross for us, for our sins, <clears throat> and making us righteous. Ephesians 4, 2, 4, and 5 says, But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead in our trespasses, dead in our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by his God's grace that you have been saved. His mercy caused him to do that. Mercy is when we're given what we do not deserve or we are not given what we do deserve. You know, we were dead in our sins. We didn't deserve mercy, but he gave it. He poured it out on us. It's closely related to forgiveness. They're very, very close to each other, this, this idea of mercy. And we see sometimes how mercy and truth can, can feel like there's a conflict there. Because if we know the whole truth, if we know the reality, then we want to uh, the consequences of that truth to, to, to play out. And mercy comes along and says, let's, let's forgive. And so it seems like there's almost a conflict there. The third voice that we see is righteousness and justice. Seeing this in the concept of us being in the image of God is very important. Jesus said, God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. Righteousness and justice are, are, are like a, one coin with two different sides. They are, they are the, the same. And in the Bible, they're oftentimes used next to each other. We are created as imagers of God and to show righteousness, to have righteousness towards someone, to have justice is to treat others with dignity and fairness. You know, us as uh, human beings, we have a tendency to redefine righteousness and justice to suit what we want to be suited. We redefine those things. But the righteousness and the justice that God speaks of is, is more than that. It is not to take advantage of something, but to be an advocate for someone. There's the, the story of the Old Testament and the Israel and the Israel people of Israel starts with Abraham, <clears throat> who God chose and called him and his family for a specific purpose. The purpose was to, to reflect himself. They were, they were chosen imagers of God to, to he's it. I'm gonna, I'm going, you're going to be my representation. I'm setting you apart from the rest of the people on this, this earth. And this is what he says. This is interesting what he says that the, the purpose is. He says, for I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised. The purpose is, was for them to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. These two words, I'm going to take a moment just to, to dive a little deeper in this. In Hebrew, zedekah is the name righteousness, and it, and it has this context of being in right relationship with others, being in right relationship between people, and treating others with the dignity and respect that, that they have as imagers of God. And this other word, justice, the Hebrew word is mishpat. And this, is, this can be referred to as, uh, as retributive justice. You know, if someone steals something, they need to experience justice. You know, they're, they're going to suffer the consequences of that. And that definitely is a part, uh, is, is used that way in Scripture, but it's also used as not, not, not for retribution, but for restoration. And that's usually the way that we see it, is, is, is seeking out the vulnerable. That This is an active thing that takes place where we're, we're seeking justice for others. Proverbs 31 says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and the helpless and see that they get justice. It's more than charity. 
It's advocating for the vulnerable, for social change in structures that are, are devastating to people. It is our, our duty to, to look to ways to prevent injustice. Jeremiah 22, 3 says, This is what the Lord says, Uphold justice and righteousness. Deliver from their oppressors those who have been robbed. Don't mistreat or do violence to the alien or the orphan or the widow or shed the blood of innocent people in this place. So Abraham's family was called to this purpose of righteousness and justice and to bring that to the world, but they failed in that. And though they, they were chosen with that purpose, they continually walked away from it. And there's this interesting exchange in the book of Micah, where, where, where God is, is, is laying out his case against his people. And then they respond to it. It says, my people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. They were enslaved in Egypt. God rescued them. And then they turned their backs on him again. He's saying, what, what, what was this massive burden that I put on you? And their response is, is interesting. It's almost like a sarcastic response that they have. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams, with ten thousand rivers of olive oil, which is an absurdity? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the first fruit of my body for the sins of my soul? And this is what he says He has shown you, O mortal man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy and walk humbly with our God. Jesus, it makes it clear that the, the Bible, that we are, we are all wicked. We are all the oppressors in this. For whatever reason, human beings have a tendency, even when the, the oppressed are somehow not to be oppressed anymore, they become the oppressors. We just do this. This is like a part of our, of our nature. But that's not what we're called to do. This is what it says in 2 Corinthians. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That we, through nothing that we've done of our own, become the righteousness of God. What does that even mean to be the righteousness of God? It's more than just the status. It's more than saying, I'm, the right, I'm in right standing. I've, I've gotten a badge on that says I'm, I'm righteous. I'm right. I'm good. That's not what he's saying. It's, if God declares someone righteous who doesn't deserve it, the only reasonable response is to go and seek righteousness and justice for others. That's what we're called to do. As soon as we're drawn into God's family or adopted into his family, immediately we, our response is to, to reflect that back to our world. This is radically inconvenient. It is a courageous thing to make other people's problems your problems. That's what we're called to do. This is what Jesus meant by love your neighbor as yourself. Lastly, peace. Jesus said, God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. This isn't up on the slide, but I thought about this after I put the slides together. Martin Luther King, he said, true peace is not merely the absence of tension. It's the presence of justice. Peace is not the absence of conflict, but it is something in its place. Peace points to something whole. 
the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. Shalom is a, a word that means a lot of things. Um, and it is very rich. It's very complex. There's a lot of nuance to the word shalom. We just simply translate it as peace, but it, it means a lot. A few examples, the, the, uh, I'm not even going to read all the scriptures. You can put them on, on the, the screen, but shalom is used to describe the stones of the altar as uncut stones that haven't been, nothing has happened to them. They're pure stones. They're whole stones. They're complete stones. So they were called to, to go get shalom stones. It also uh, can be used to describe a wall with no gaps. Stones that have been put together and there's, 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 it's impenetrable. There's no, nothing breaking. It is a complete wall. It's a whole wall. It is a full one wall. This concept of shalom being complete and whole and one. In Job, uh, shalom is used to, 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 to say uh, that you, you've got everything in, uh, that is whole. He says, you know that your home is safe. Your home is shalom. When you survey your possessions, nothing will be missing. Completeness, wholeness. David when he goes out to see his brothers on the battlefield, he says, you know, he, he was inquiring about their shalom. Are they, how are they doing? Are they doing okay? Are they doing well? And finally, this idea of restorative peace. And, and you know, if, if you were to, uh, in Exodus, if you were, if you're one of your livestock went to someone else's land and ate their food, damaged some of their property, you would shalom them by making it right. You would give them back what had been lost or what you had caused or what your animal had caused. It's this idea of, of making restoration, making somebody whole. This idea of shalom is really that is what we are called to do. We're called to be peacemakers. We actively make peace. We see that, I like that, the, the, the idea of, of shalom being a wall without gaps. If you start taking apart some of the pieces of that, the wall starts to crumble. And that's what our purpose is, is to restore that back to completeness is to put the pieces back together to make it whole and to make it strong and to make it complete in one it's more than the absence of conflict it's it's the completion of restoration this verse again in psalm 85 mercy and truth have met together Justice and peace have kissed. The four of these coming together is the place of reconciliation. This is what it means when these four things come together. These four things have to be in place in order for reconciliation to take place. There's a, a book that I've been reading throughout this series by John Paul Lederach, who is a a peace builder for decades has uh, gone in many different conflict zones uh, across the world, uh, Central America, South America, Africa, the Middle East. And he took this verse, he's a Christian, this verse here in Psalm 8510, and this is his uh, basis for how he conducts peace building. And he, he mentions here in, in his book, though he has the education, his education level is higher than sometimes, uh, you know, villages and places that he's gone to that are experiencing conflict. He noticed that they had a better understanding sometimes of what it means to be a peacemaker, what it means to be a peace builder and to have peace. 
So uh, I've got a few people I'm going to ask to come on up. And uh, he wrote this script, and this is found in his book, uh, The Journey Towards Reconciliation, because he noticed that in his, his discussions with, with people in conflict, that they would have consistently these four voices would come to the surface. Consistently, these four voices would, would, uh, would, he would recognize that one person is coming from a perspective of truth, and one person is coming from a perspective of mercy, and another from justice. And so what does that look like in that conversation? So I've asked these, these uh, people to come on up, if you would, please. So we have over here, this is truth and mercy and justice and peace. When conflict erupts, I keep hearing people appealing to truth, mercy, justice, and peace. The arguments and blows go round and round. What if instead we invite our friends, these four, to join us and openly discuss their views about conflict? Truth mercy, justice, and peace. We want to know what concerns you have in the midst of conflict. May we hear your views. I am truth. I am like light that is cast so all may see. In times of conflict, I want to bring forward what really happened, putting it out in the open, not the watered-down version, not a partial recounting. My handmaidens are transparency, honesty, and clarity. I am set apart from my three colleagues here because they need me first and foremost. Without me, they cannot go forward. When I am found, I set people free. Truth, you, you know I have been around a lot of conflict. There's one thing I'm always curious about. When I talk to one side, like these people over here, they say that you're with them. And when I talk with the others, like our friends over there, they claim... You are on their side. In the middle of all this pain, you seem to come and go. Is there only one truth? There is only one truth, but I can be experienced in many different ways. I reside within each person, yet nobody owns me. If discovering you is so crucial, why are you so hard to find? Well, I can only appear when the search is genuine and authentic. I come forward only when each person shares with others what they know of me and when each person or when each one respects the other's voices. Where I am strutted before or when I am strutted before others, excuse me, where I am strutted before others like a hand puppet on a child's stage, I am abused and shattered and I disappear. Of these three friends, whom do you fear the most? Mercy. I fear mercy. In mercy's haste to heal, mercy covers my light and clouds my clarity. Mercy forgets that forgiveness, our only child, is our only child, not mercy's alone. I'm sure you have things to say, mercy. What concerns you? I am mercy. I'm the new beginning. I'm concerned when pe with people in their relationships. Acceptance, compassion, and support stand with me. I know the frailty of the human condition. Who among them is perfect? Truth knows that her light can bring clarity, but too often it blinds and burns. What freedom is there without life and relationship? Forgiveness is indeed our child, but not when people are arrogantly clubbed into humiliation and agony with their imperfections and weakness. Our child forgiveness was birthed to provide healing. But Mercy, in your rush to accept, support, and move ahead, do you not lose your child forgiveness? I do not cover true slight. 
you must understand I am mercy. I am built with steadfast love that supports life itself. It is my purpose to life to bring forward the eternal grace of new beginnings. And whom do you fear the most? My sister, Justice. In her haste to change and make things right, forgets that her roots lie in real people and relationships. So, Sister Justice, what do you have to say? <laughs> I am Justice. Mercy is correct. I am concerned about making things right. I consider my, myself a person who looks beneath the surface and behind the issues about which people seem to fight. The root of most conflicts are tangled in inequity, greed, and wrongdoing. I stand with truth, who sheds her light to expose the paths of wrongdoing. My task is to make sure that when something is done, that something is done to repair the damage wrecked, especially on the victims and the downtrodden, we must restore the relationship, but never while failing to acknowledge and rectify what we broke the relationship in the first place. But Sister Justice, everyone in the room feels they have been wronged. Most are willing to justify their actions, even violent deeds, as doing your bidding. Is this not true? It is indeed. Most do not understand. You see, I am most concerned about accountability. Often we think that anything and everything is acceptable. Truth and committed relationships have honest accounting and steadfast love. Love without account accountability is nothing but words. Love with accountability is changed, beha changed behavior and action. This is the real meaning of restoration. My purpose is to bring action and accountability to the words. Then whom do you fear? My children. I fear that my children, mercy and peace, see themselves as parents, yet they're actually the fruit of my labor. I am peace, and I agree with all three. I am the child to whom they give birth, the mother who labors to give them life, and the spouse who accompanies them on the way. I hold the community together with the encouragement of security, respect, and well-being. You see yourself as greater and bigger than the rest of us. Arrogance. You do not place yourself where you belong. You follow us. You do not precede us. That is true, justice and uh, truth. I am more fully expressed through and after you both. But it is also true that without me, there is no space cleared for truth to be heard. And without me, there is no way to break out of the vicious cycle of accusation, bitterness, and bloodshed. You, yourself, justice, cannot be fully embodied without my presence. I am before and after. There is no other way to reach me. I, myself, am the way. And whom do you fear? Not who, but what and when. I fear manipulation. I fear the manipulation of people using truth for their own purposes. Some ignore her. Some use her as a whip. Some claim to own her. I fear times when justice is sacrificed for the sake of mercy. And I fear the blind manipulation when some will sacrifice life itself in trying to reach the ideal of justice. When such trickery takes place, I am violated and left as an empty shell. How would it be possible for you four to meet? What would you need from each other? You must slow down, Mercy. Give me a chance to emerge. Our child forgiveness cannot be born without the slow development in the womb of the mother. Shine bright, dear truth, but please take care not to blind and burn. Remember that each person is a child of God. Each is weak and needs support to grow. I've been partially reassured by the words of peace. 
I need a clear statement that she gives us a place for accountability and action. Remember when Micah, Micah 6 and 8, spoke of us, love, mercy, and do justice? You, peace, must allow room for me to come forward. If not, you will be lost. Sister Justice, we need one another. Do not let your heart of compassion fall into bitterness that rages without purpose. I will provide the soil for you to work and bear fruit. What is this place where you stand together? This place is called reconciliation. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. Let's give them a hand. Earlier this year, uh, Brian Carey from Peace Catalyst was here, and he did a, uh, a session with us after service. And we went through that script, and I thought that was very powerful to me because I think that it's, uh, it's easy for us to get into a place where we grab a hold of one aspect of reconciliation, but we don't want to see other aspects of it. And we hold on to our truth, and we resist the others. But the reality is that they are interwoven with each other. We even see it in the Scripture. Even as I was reading one verse about one of the voices, other voices come into there. It's an interwoven thing. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up uh, here in a moment and sing a song. But I think it would be good for us to, to think for a moment about what it means to be an imager of God and what it means to bring reconciliation to our world. I think this can be applied to our individual relationships, but especially to the, our, our society, especially to, um, to our communities reconciliation. What does that mean? What does that look like? I'd like for us to, to get an, an image of that, maybe a topic or something that, that we see, a wall, if you will, a wall of peace that is crumbling, that has been broken, that is, that is, that is not sturdy. And where is God calling us to put those pieces back together, to be the peacemakers. And in order to be the peacemaker, we have to have the truth. We have to show mercy. And we have to have justice. But those all do come together. And I love this verse here. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness, justice, and peace have kissed come back together. They come together in that place of restoration. Let's stand for a moment and we'll pray. Lord, I pray that you show us in a meaningful way, God, in a, in a way that we can put into action what it means to be a people of reconciliation what it means to be imagers of God in our families, in our friendships, in our relationships, in our community, in our culture, in our country, in our world. God, you have, that is what you have called the church to be. Your word asks the question, do you not know that we are the temple of God? We are the bricks that come together to make the temple, that we're the body of Christ, that is what we are called to do, is to bring restoration to our world, Lord. Lord, I pray that these, these four voices of truth, mercy, justice, and peace show us which voices that we are deaf to, that we don't hear. And Lord, I pray that we do hear them. We, we, acknowledge them in our lives and we see what it looks like to hear those voices 
to put those voices into action in our lives. Praise your name, God. Lord, we just lift up your name right now, the name above all names. As you came and restored us, you reconciled yourself to us that while we were still sinners, you died for us. And that we are your righteousness. We worship you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Worship team, lead us in this song.